imagine for a moment, it's been two lunar days. That's about 60 days on Earth. You have been in perpetual darkness in the south pole of the moon. Today's a big day. Improved lighting conditions are on the horizon, literally. You know what that means. It's time to adjust that solar array and power up. You gear up in your exploration suit, and as you're making the fix, you look up. And there it is this bright blue marvel in the distance. This is your view. And you chuckle and say, this never gets old. That was just a story of where we are headed, a story of how we aim to live and work on the moon. It will be a reality in this decade. Just because humans have not been to the moon since 1972 does not mean we have not been preparing to go back. We want to explore more of our solar system and do it sustainably. So understanding the effects of long-duration missions on humans is incredibly important. Currently, science and technology missions are leading the way. Our bots are helping us get ready for our boots. We are going from Apollo to Artemis. Apollo's twin sister and goddess of the moon. So why am I standing in front of you today? I'm not a scientist or an engineer, but I'm talking to you about space exploration. My passion and driving force is to emphasize the importance of telling our exploration story. Yes, our story. I love what I do. It genuinely excites me. When people ask me what I do, I'll often say, I'm a professional storyteller. I've spent my career looking at the stories behind some pretty impressive projects, goals, and individuals. I've seen stories unfold, history being made, and it's made me realize that the multiple perspectives that weave together a powerful narrative create an impact like no other. So you want to hear a story? Over the course of six Apollo missions, astronauts brought back 842 pounds of moon rocks. These geologic wonders have served the science community well to this day. Yes, people are still studying the samples that came back to Earth over 50 years ago. But more on this in a second. Let's go back to Apollo. During this era of exploration, the science community had the foresight that they would need to save some of these samples for future generations of scientists because tools and methods would evolve. So some of these samples were stored, untouched, unopened for five decades. Think about that. One of these samples was vacuum sealed on the moon and then sealed in a similar vacuum when it was brought back to Earth so it remained pristine. A group of scientists in what's called the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis, or ANCSA, developed a method to study this sample. First, they extracted gas from this vacuum-sealed tube to see if there was a lunar gas present. Then they gave the tube a CT scan, yes, the same CT scan that we could get, so they could image the inside and prepare for its dissection without any surprises. And finally, they spent a few grueling weeks getting the sample sorted millimeter by millimeter. Now, the, the ANCSA scientists are going to study the sample to prepare for future Artemis missions. How cool is that? This is a decade-spanning story across generations and specialties, and I got to tell this story. I was in the room when they extracted the gas, there when they opened the sample. I got to capture their excitement, their nerves, their passion for exploration and discovery a story we needed to tell from all angles, and we needed to do it collaboratively because it takes many to explore. If we want to tell a human story, the power of the collective is what creates a powerful narrative. So, now that you've heard this story, you might be wondering, go to the moon, been there, done that, right? But have you considered where we went on the moon? The Apollo astronauts explored the equatorial region of the moon. 
That equates to about the size of the continent of Africa. Now think about our home planet, our Earth, and exploring just one continent? Would you buy a big, beautiful home and only hang out in the foyer? How much are we learning? What's missing? What do we need to do to tell a cohesive story? Do you remember history class? Yeah, I do. I learned about these 14th and 15th century explorers who set out on a journey in search of a new world. And I would often ask myself, why would they venture into the unknown? Gosh, that's so scary. Fast forward several years, we are exploring off our Earth in our universe, and I think I have an answer to my naive question. Humans have this innate need to explore. We want to solve problems, learn new things, and learn about the evolution of our solar system. But what's different now, you ask? The world is a smaller place. Information travels quick, and there are several perspectives that can tell that story. They go well beyond textbooks in a classroom. A single perspective is not the only way. We all have a role to play here. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We've heard these famous words from Neil Armstrong after he planted his boots on the moon. But notice how he does not focus on a single entity or nation. He focuses on all of humanity. This is because we are doing this together. Our exploration story needs to be told, and it needs to be told collaboratively. The story of space exploration is not just written by scientists and engineers in the form of research and data. It's the power of humanity that brings us together. It's the wonder of space. Storytelling is universal, and by terror, is telling our stories of triumph, of tribulations, we are affirming to one another that we are in this together. So I have another story for you. And this one's just beginning. I'm currently leading communications for an activity called Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLIPS. The easiest way that I can explain CLIPS is, you have a bunch of packages that need to be delivered, so you hire a package delivery company to get those packages to your destination. Simple, right? NASA's working with commercial companies to send its science and technology to the moon. It's working to build a commercial economy on another celestial body. And these are not NASA missions. There's a company that's responsible to develop the spacecraft to carry the payloads, to procure the rocket, and to pick the best place to land. To add, there are over 40 payloads across eight missions going to different parts of the moon. This is a story of many. There's not just one entity that can tell this story. If you heard a portion of this, it would be like removing a chapter from a book. A single perspective is not the only way. I'm incredibly excited about telling this story of innovation, and I'm working with several teams to make sure that we're telling this story cohesively. Just like one note does not create a song, a single perspective is not the only narrative. Consider this. Have you ever thought about the first word spoken on the moon? Houston. The eagle has landed. Houston. Standing with you today in that very Houston, I'm here to tell you that we are going back to the moon in a new and exciting way. We are exploring the far side of the moon, the south pole of the moon, places that are permanently shadowed, places with harsh environments, harsh lighting conditions, and it's just not a single entity that's doing this. Countries across the globe, small and large commercial companies, academia, students, scientists, even you and I, we're a part of this. We're doing it together. This time, it's not a race. It's a relay for long-term sustainable exploration from an evolved point of view. There are hundreds of thousands of technical people out there working through the barriers that we are about to encounter and running scenarios on things that could go wrong. But if people like me, who sit where I sit, don't bridge that gap, we will not be telling all of humanity what it takes to explore and how it really does take all of humanity to make it happen. Storytelling is universal. We all have a story to tell. I invite you to be part of this exploration story to create a world of understanding and a world of explorers on and off our Earth. Thank you.